you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. The pastor came to a new church after he'd been there for a few months. He got to know some of the folks and some of the names, and uh, two of the most influential men in the church happened to be brothers. They also happened to be millionaires, and who were not known basically for their godly living. And he was determined, though, to have an authentic ministry there in terms of his preaching of the word. But as time would go on, one of the brothers died. So the other brother, who was still alive, went to the pastor and said to the pastor, Now, Pastor, I know that you're going to be doing a funeral in, in a couple of days, and I also know that you want to build a brand new church building. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I will put the money in the church's account to build a brand new church if you will say at my brother's funeral that he was a saint. The pastor felt like he was on the horns of a dilemma. On the one hand, he desired to be authentic, and on the other hand, he needed the cash. The question was how to build a new church with the money sitting right in front of him. But also to recognize the person that was going to be put into the grave was a guy who was a crook. The pastor thought for a second and said, well, I will do it. This man wrote out a check for him. Hundreds of thousands of dollars gave it to the pastor right there on his desk. The pastor deposited the bank account of the church, and it came time for the funeral. He got up to do the eulogy. And he said, as he stood there, ladies and gentlemen, we are here today to remember a very ungodly sinner. He was a very wicked man who was unfaithful to his wife, who was hot tempered, he abused his children, he was ruthless in business, and he was a pure hypocrite at church. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> and I have my brother right here in front of me. No. <laughs> any, of you, any of you want to make a donation as to whether I put that in? Okay. Stanford Research Institute was making a study of how different people think and how they perceive things differently. They devised a short kind of succinct test in terms of interviewing people and asking them a question. And they proceeded to call in several different people from different walks of life in terms of asking them this question. First person that came in was an engineer. The researchers asked him, tell us, what does two plus two mean? The engineer replied by saying, well, if you mean in absolute terms, two plus two equals four. The researchers wrote their notes, said thank you, and dismissed it. Next guy that came in was an architect. They asked him the same question. And he replied by saying, well, there are several possibilities. I mean, two plus two equals four, but also three plus one equals four, or two and a half plus one and a half, that equals four. So basically, it's a choice of the different options that you have in front of you. Researchers, again, wrote down in their notes what, they, what had been said. The last of the three to come in was an attorney. <laughs> And he said to them, uh, they, he said to them uh, he, or he, they said to him, what does two put plus two make? The lawyer quickly looked around the room. You, you mind if I close this door? And then he went and stood right in front of them and said, now, let me ask you, tell me, what would you like it to be? Is truth relative? Does truth change? It's interesting that truth is the first piece or first weapon in the believer's arsenal. The first part of the armor is truth, in which everything is attached to that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Stand firm then, the belt of truth. Buckle it around your waist. Now, just to give you a heads up in terms of looking over the next few weeks of time about the armor, we need to understand precisely about what the armor is. You'll see on the front cover, you can see that, and you should, you should have known them by heart anyway. You all know the pieces. There are six pieces. There's actually a seventh that we'll talk about later. But there are two general divisions when you look at this passage in Ephesians chapter 6 in terms of classification of the pieces of the armor that are indicated, they're indicated by the tense the tense of the verbs which are used. You note the passage, you're looking at it right in front of you. 
The first division covering the first three pieces is something that we have already done. In other words, it's something in the past. If we are Christians, we have girded on our loins with truth. We have put on the breastplate of righteousness. We have shot our feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. If we are Christians, all those three are on. Those are all referred to as already done, if we are believers. The second division you see in the passage there is that we are to put on or take up at different moments, at different times. So we take up the shield of faith, we take up the helmet of salvation, we take up the sword of the Spirit. In other words, the, the, there are first the things that we already put on once and never need to put off, but we must be sure that they are there and remind ourselves what they are, what they mean. And then the second aspect of those aspects of Christ is, is it's a different aspect of Christ that we take up. We take up again and again whenever we feel that we are under attack. All right? So this first piece of spiritual armor is the built of truth, which refers to a thick leather belt. It's on the back, uh, and the sermon notes on the back cover gives you an idea of a picture of it. Uh, the Roman soldier wore it to hold his tunic in place, to which was attached this sheath of the sword. Uh, the bell may have also had a strap that went over the top of the shoulder, not part with this. The Roman soldier girded his loins. What he would do is that he would tuck his long robe. Many times his robe would go down to his knees or even below. And what he would do is he would gather them up and tuck them into the belt so that it would not hinder him in movement or running or fighting. In a similar fashion, a Christian must prepare himself for a spiritual battle by fixing in place his commitment to the truth of Scripture and steering his mind to follow that truth. In other words, this keeps the aspects of falsehood or other things entangling your legs, tripping you up as you are going into battle. Peter uses the same idea in 1 Peter 1, verse 13. He says, therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. This means prepare your minds for action. In other words, get ready for combat. Be self-controlled. Get focused. In other words, the Christian must prepare himself for the battle by making a total commitment. It is a total commitment to the truth of Scripture. And by setting his mind that that is the truth I will follow. A man named Zonik Shaham, Sheham, is a general of the Israeli Armed Forces. He knows this passage, not this passage, but very similar to it, too well. Because he says, commitment is the whole issue of the Israeli army. People think that Israelis are super soldiers with superior intellect and strength. And they think that we win because of that. It's not that. We win because we are truly committed. We... We win by commitment, and we even still use the phrase, gird up your loins, to mean commitment, to mean preparedness. Though truthfulness is necessary for victory, it does not come easily. In our world, it's very difficult today. We have a battle about truth. That's your truth. That's your truth for you. That's not my truth, but that's your truth. Charles Colson, like Charles Colson, believes that our American society's constant mindless engagement with the media where trash is heaped upon trash and has left us morally exhausted and without discernment. He writes, the inability to make moral distinctions has put upon us a moral blindness in our culture. In a culture infected with moral blindness, words lose all meaning. In other words, words become manipulated to obscure what they're actually saying. In other words, we don't say taxes anymore. We say revenue enhancement. We don't call it perversion, we call it gay. We call it murder of unborn children, we call that health care. Marxism in the church is called liberation theology. We can't say a woman, we have to say a pregnant person. It's interesting, words have been used like that down through time. The Nazis used the same idea with words. They called it the final solution. That had nothing to do with Jews, it's just the 
final solution. And everyone just sort of goes along with the words. But when words lose their meaning, it's nearly impossible for the word of God to be received. In other words, sin, repentance, they mean nothing. And then if you can't say sin and repentance, then God's grace, how do you explain God's grace? It becomes irrelevant. Our preaching can fall on deaf ears, the moral deafness that leads to disaster. Scripture tells us back in 1 Kings chapter 16, when people were accepting King Ahab's gross evils as basically trivial, and the fearsome judgment that would now befall against Israel, this is where we are right now in our own culture. We now have one truth for the elite and a separate truth for the people. Many times we say the network news reporting from many times masqueraded as being objective. Have you heard about Bud Light and, and Target and Disney? Why they are losing money? And you need to get another way of getting your news. The advertising industry is institutionalized in deceit. We live in a foggy land of deception. The tragic result is, is that many who claim that they are the light from the Lord are really doing untruth. That took place this past week. The results of a Gallup poll revealed that ethical standards of Christians are no different than the world standards. We're no higher than non-Christians. This includes honesty in business, or facts, or bringing truth to the word. The alarming news is that if anyone should be standing apart from the crowd, it should be believers, it should be Christians that follow the truth. We should be different. I like the cartoon of a pastor who was shown greeting people at the end of the sermon that they're walking out in the worship service and there's a pastor shaking hands with one lady and one lady states, well, what you said about heaven today was very interesting. I'm going to go home and check it out with Oprah. <laughs> you know you have found the truth when you find something which is wide enough and deep enough and high enough to encompass all things. And that only happens in Jesus Christ. Number one, that's in the back of your bulletin, Christ is the truth. He is the reality. He is the key to life. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, some will ask, well, how do you know that? I mean, aren't you sort of, aren't you just basically saying sort of accept this sort of in a blind faith? Aren't we just forced to, you're saying all this is true, but is there any supporting evidence? You say you should believe in Jesus, and that you've accepted his authority without any evidence to support it? That's blind faith. Let me just say that as Christians, we should not be in blind faith. Christian faith is not a blind faith. We believe in a Christ who is the truth. And we believe it because he demonstrated, first of all, that he was the truth. Even the people that accused him could never accuse him of lying. And we need to put it on that basis. It's interesting, I think a century and a half ago, an old man is traveling on a, on a train in France, and a much younger man gets into the same car with him, and uh, the old man reaches into his valise and he takes out his Bible and he begins read, reading his Bible. And after a while, the young man decides to strike up conversation. He says, What are you reading? He says, I'm reading the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. He says, What does it say? And he says, Well, it's the story of the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. And the Gospel writer tells about a vast crowd that Jesus speaking to, he's performing healing for the sick, and Jesus is preaching with the crowd. It's all the way to darkness, and they're hungry. And with that, there are five barley loaves and a couple of dried fishes. Jesus feeds the entire crowd. In fact, when they gathered up the leftovers, there were 12 baskets left. The younger man looks at him and says, yeah, right. Do you really believe that? The solar gentleman said, yes. You know, I, can't, I can see that you've been brainwashed by ancient superstitions. That could never happen to me. You see, I am a scientist. Everything that happens has to be scientifically accurate. It ultimately has to be accounted scientifically. The story you have read defies the laws of science, therefore it's sheer fantasy. Give me the facts. Give me the provable facts. Matter of science, I can know no faith in miracles, but I cannot expect, I can expect you to understand that. At that point, the train slowed down. The young man said, well, here's my station, rose from his seat, held out his hand and said, it was nice talking to you, Mr. I'm sorry, I never did find out her name. And with that, the old man reached in his pocket, pulled out his card, gave him his uh, calling card. 
On the caller card it said, Louis Pasteur. <laughs> One of the great scientists. How did Christ demonstrate that he was the truth? First of all, he did it by what he said. Reading the things that he said, things that he said are incomparable to any of them. He gave the clearest insights into human life that have ever been given in the hearing of men. Even his enemies said so. No one ever saw so clearly as he did as he probed deeply into people's lives or put his finger so precisely upon the elements which make up human life and thinking. And what he said, you can see, is he speaking the truth, as one man said, no one ever spoke like this guy. But not only did he demonstrate the truth by what he said, but also by what he did. We see an amazing account when you go through the New Testament and you look at Jesus' life. And the account of the deeds and the historic evidence that shows his life. Yes, miracles, there are evidences of the intrusion in the spiritual kingdom, the invisible realm, into the visible realm. And Jesus did it all by showing that he has solved the one problem which is insoluble. What is our major problem for all of us? It's death. And yet he solved the problem of death. He rose from the dead. Who else has ever done that? That's why I know that Jesus is the truth. Because he is the one who did solve the problem that we all have. And this, by the way, is why the enemies of Scripture fight so fiercely to destroy the historicity of those events. You can't believe that. That's way back 2,000 years ago. How can you believe stuff like that? They want us to think it does not matter whether these were historically true or not. Of course they're historically true. They want to make Jesus sort of a mythical creature. But these events truly demonstrate who Jesus is, that he was the truth. The second thing is, is that not only what he said, but what he did, but also what he is. It brings us into our own thinking of our thinking today. What, what has he been to you? What has he been to your friends? What has he been in your life? Has Jesus set you free? Has Jesus broken chains in your life? Has he been your friend? Has he brought you back into balance? Has he brought you back into harmony? It's been pointed out that through the centuries, people have called others for help. Throughout time, everyone has had a moment where they have called out to something or someone. Maybe your feeling is, well, I don't have enough courage. Mr. President, can you help me? No one answers. You may lack wisdom, so you say, Bill Gates, can you help me? Or you lack eloquence, so you cry out, Shakespeare, can you help me? Yet for 21 centuries, men and women of desperate and desperate plight have been calling out, but they have been calling out, Jesus Christ, can you help me? And deliverance has come. There's a guy who walked into a large church building. He walked inside these big, massive doors. Inside there was a narthex, and in the narthex there were pictures on the wall. And the pictures were of famous portraits of people throughout history. There was Mahat Gandhi, there was Abraham Lincoln, there was Jesus of Nazareth, there was one of the philosophers, Socrates, I think. There was uh, President Roosevelt, picture up there, and above them was a great rock bronze engraving plaque that said you are all sons of God. Dot, dot, dot. And the quote was from Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. Men took out his New Testament. Look at the verse in Galatians 3 26. The verse says you are all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. They weren't all sons of God unless they were in Christ Jesus. In other words, you need the whole truth. Number three, the believer's commitment to truth goes far beyond a philosophical understanding of the importance of truth. We must be committed to be committed to the truth ourselves. In the Old Testament, in a parallel passage to Ephesians 6, is a passage from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5. And righteousness will be a belt about his loins, and faithfulness, or truth, the belt around his waist. 
The word faithfulness here does not speak of just doctrine. It speaks of the aspect of character. Isaiah 11:5. What made Jesus Christ victorious as a king? When he came to earth, his character was revealed in his faithfulness. He was sold out to his father because their relationship was pure and full of integrity, and he could stand as he stood before the evil one. He could stand in integrity before him because of his faithfulness to God. The point is, is that when we face the evil one, we must put on Christ. We need his faithfulness, for we cannot go into battle with internal deceit or with lack of integrity in our own lives. How can we face the grand deceiver of our lives if we are filled with deceit ourselves? You'll be wiped out. But Christ is always true to his word. He always and only speaks and acts that which is true. And since we are created to be like God, we must speak and act according to what is true. Can you imagine God being anything other than truthful? Can you believe, can you, can you think of God saying, oh yeah, I know, I, I know I was going to break into history and put out sin and pain and righteousness and I'm going to do this new heaven, new earth thing and, where my children would live forever, love them forever. But, I'm sorry, I lied. Or, I got too busy. It, 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 it doesn't look like I'm going to get around to dealing with your problem. Uh, you'll have to make it on your own for a while. Good luck. It's incomprehensible to hear that. To say that that's what God would tell us. A truly fearsome thought. We count on God because he is utterly true to his word. You see, truth never needs updating. Truth never needs to be modernized. If it was true 10,000 years ago, it's true today. If it's true today, it will be true 10,000 years in the future. In other words, truth does not need to be updated. The story of a man who came to his old friend and he said to him in a flippant way, as I would say to Dan, what's the good news today? The old man never said a word. He just walked over to a piano like Dan is doing. And he struck the, the note A. As the note sounded out through the room, he said, that's an A. That's an A today. That's an A that will be tomorrow. That was an A 5,000 years ago. It will be an A 10,000 years from now. That's the, he said, the soprano upstairs sings off key. The tenor downstairs flats his high notes, and the clarinet in the other room is out of tune. He struck the note A. That's an A, my friend, and that's the good news for today. Thank you. That's what Jesus Christ is. He is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today. This is what it means to buckle on the belt of truth. How's the spiritual battle going in your own life? If you're having trouble, it may be that you need to tighten the belt to regird yourself with truth. When we are committed to believing the truth, we believe the promises of God and we rest in them. When we believe the commands of God, we obey them. When we trust the truth of Scripture, we order our lives around that truth. What Paul is telling us to do is to put our belt put on our belt in an attitude of commitment. In an attitude that says, I'm ready for the battle. I'm ready for the war that's coming my way. Let's bow. In this time of quiet, the question is, have you made that commitment? It is found in the moment in which we say, Lord, I want you as my Savior and Lord to forgive my sins, come into my life, that I may be forgiven, that I may know the truth of what Jesus Christ has done. We are mindful always, Lord, that you came and you told us the truth. Sometimes it was difficult to hear. But Lord, we are glad that you, the man of truth, 
has shared that with us so that we do not have to fall into falsehood and error, but rather that we can put our trust in you. Thank you for God's believing people who put their trust in the truth of Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen.